Um, well, welcome everyone to this uh, second Friday Forum of 2022. And today's forum will be completely focused on Max's opera Taverner, which of course is 50 years old this year. And uh, it was premiered on the 12th of July, 1972. So it celebrates its 50th anniversary next Tuesday. And um, I'd like to welcome to our Friday Forum, um, Simon Lord. And uh, Simon is the, uh, the Director of Artistic Planning at the Adelaide Symphony Orchestra. He's been in that role since moving to Australia from the UK in 2010. And prior to that, Simon was Senior Producer of the BBC Scottish Symphony Orchestra in Glasgow for 15 years. And before then, he was a music producer for BBC Radio 3 Music Department in London, and he worked with the BBC Singers, BBC Symphony Orchestra, and at the BBC Proms. As an undergraduate, Simon studied music at the University of Leeds. He did his master's at the University of Surrey and completed a PhD at the University of Adelaide. And when he was at the BBC, Simon worked with many composers, including Harry Birtwistle, Jonathan Harvey, Judith Weir, Sally Beamish and Jimmy McMillan. And of course, he worked with Max. And he worked with Max several times, in fact, at the St Magnus Festival during the late 1990s and 2000s, and was producer of a concert performance of Taverner in Glasgow in 2009. And this formed part of Max's 75th birthday celebrations. So we'll be hearing from Simon in a moment, but to start today's forum, I'm going to pass over to my colleague, um, Richard McGregor, and he's going to put the work into some kind of context for us. So thank you, Richard. Okay, I'll just share my screen. And um, start the slideshow. Um, I've done a bit of work trying to find out what the sequence of composition was. Uh, it made more difficult by the fact that uh, Max's uh, diaries don't exist from 62 to 63, which means that uh, Taverner itself, the production and what led up to that is not covered, unfortunately. However, um, he did leave a, a number of letters, at least, at least those letters have survived, um, which people have mostly put into the British Library. The one set, which I'm going to refer to, is currently not in the British Library, but uh, I have, we have permission to quote from them. Um, these uh, these indicate where or how uh, Max went about actually thinking through the various aspects of Tavener to begin with. The, the early diary in 1957 um, is probably the most interesting. Um, but before I do that, this is in 1974. The diary is incorrectly labelled at, at the British Library of, uh, as 1961 to 66 to 71. It's actually 1974, as is proved by the fact that it's mostly about Miss Donnithorne and being in Australia in 1974. But you can see that um, this idea of the moment of insight with three Tavener, the three operas, Tavener, Resurrection, and I'll come to Resurrection right at the very end. And we don't know what the third one was seen from afar. Actually, there were probably, if you now count, four. But the third one would probably be the Doctor of Midfi. Anyway, but he didn't know that at the time. Um, but this is the first real entry. Um, there's no date on it, um, but he is in the diary, he's stuck in a program from April and it's very close to this entry. So I think it's probably around April 1957 that he gets this first idea about he's going to have a, an opera called Taverner. And at that point, there's a whole series of things about what it's going to have in it. Um, th th like four pages worth of a kind of outline plot. Um, this is just one small bit of it, um, with, it, with this obvious question about symbolism obvious. Not quite sure what that is, but, um, but basically th there's a whole series of things, um, that he lays out in scenes already before he even gets 
to the point of thinking about what the text is going to be, how he's going to construct the libretto and so on. Um, one or two things uh, seem quite important uh, in terms of that. Again, in this the diary, Diary 24, we have him thinking about the significance of several things. A.G., for example, is Alexander Gurr in some circumstances. Uh, J.T. is a, a personal reference, but it's also John Tavener. And then we get this interesting one, but he's going to write a piece called Tudor Historical Documents. Well, in fact, he uses Tudor historical documents to construct the libretto of Tavener. Um, but in 1957, uh, the Carl Rosa Company uh, did a performance of Benvenuto Cellini. And he writes quite a lot of detail about this performance, including these, uh, these things about people dressed in masks as animals and people dressed as monks killing each other and so on, and, and a cardinal who's really a pope. And you can see that that actually um, had some effect on him the way in which he, he, he then started to think about what, what the opera was going to be about. Um, there's a, just, if you, if you look at this, uh, which is from Paul Griffiths on the right, uh, and compare it with Benvenuto Cellini, you can see that there's things like white monk, black monk, white monk, and so on. So there's, there's, there's a number of things that clearly, uh, carried over from Benvenuto Cellini. Whether he was conscious of that seven years on, although Max had something of a, 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 an amazing memory, um, it, it's quite likely that he even thought about it. And look at those jugglers as well, and they would come back in another form. Um, but then there's a whole range of other comments. There's not very much up until 1961, when he was just in his last, last year or so of uh, uh, being at uh, Sirencester. And this is, again, this idea coming back about its resurrection. And we know that resurrection was something that um, almost obsessed him through the course of his career until until he wrote Resurrection, um, and which was produced in 1987. But then the diaries at that point contain a whole range of things about, I've got to get on with Tavern, I've got to go. They all say the same thing. Um, I've got, to, I've got to do this. It's, I've got. To, if I don't do it, it's not going to be possible, and so on. So there's it, it, no no detail about what he's actually doing at this point. Just saying, I've got to get on with it. Uh, but then there's a series of letters, and basically um, you see that Diary Thirty Two in 1961 says, "I'm ready to write the opera, uh, Taverner." Then then there's the letters. So uh, on the 25th of October, we see a little bit of detail about the Antichrist, the Pope and the, Pope and the Crucifixion. November, the text is well nigh finished. Um, again, again in November, a little bit more uh, about how he's going to use Tavener to come to terms with some of the stuff that he's, he's struggling with. Then there's the letter to Donald Mitchell, which is very interesting. Now, this will be, this PowerPoint will be available. Uh, on the site, so I'm not going to go through it all, but you can see that at this point he's already beginning to, he's finished the text, he's actually starting on the, the musical material for it. Uh, and, and he says at the end of this letter, already there are 49 pages of very closely written full score. Um, then he, he writes out to, to Neil Martin again uh, in January, saying that scene one is, is done and scene two is underway. Talks a little bit what, about what's in that. Scene three will have, and then scene four is the one he's looking forward to. Um, then he writes to in February to John Donald Mitchell, and he talks about whether Temple would publish an essay on Tavener. Well, funnily enough, they did in the end. Um, the, the, there, was a, there was a collection of, of things that actually went along with Tavener when it was done. Um, but you can see that as we go on, February 20th of February, he's into scene three of the opera. He's dying to show. This is to Donald Mitchell still. And then um, another one about uh, one of March. He sent the text out to various people. And he gets an, uh, several um, letters back, I think, saying that, 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 that they don't really understand what he's trying to achieve by the, by the text. And that was something that was picked up by Joseph Kerman in his review of Tavener, that he, he thought, I don't, if, you've, if you've seen Joseph Kerman's review, basically says that a composer should stick to writing the notes and not the text. 
because Kevin didn't really understand why he'd done what he'd done. But you can see that Sessions is keen and Tippett is keen, particularly Roger Sessions. Uh, then he's, he, he's working in the 11th of March on the transition to scene four. Um, he, again, he writes to, to Eric Guest the next day, um, talking about the same thing. And then uh, two days later, again to Neil Martin, he wrote uh, often. So you see that he's talking about the jester here. And, and there's a, this is a really interesting quote about the double idea and also the, actually, the, the jester's head. Uh, 29th of April, he talks a little bit more about uh, the music of John and Richard Tavern and Rose Parrow in Act 1, Scene 4. May, <laughs> uh, uh, he begins to worry that Taverner is going to be his swan song. Now, that comes up off quite often in his in it, what he's, he writes, because he often thinks that he's, he's, this, some of his projects are so big that he won't be able to do much else. Um, 9th of May, 20th of May, we can see that on the 20th of uh, 20th September, the Maxwell Davis manuscripts at the British Library have a full score date of the 20th of September. Um, then 14th of October, he talks about um, Tavener again, and uh, he talks at this point about this new chamber work, which is going to make Tavener like be like to as to Nick Brighton. This is rest and resurrection he's talking about. Of course, which of course, which he didn't get much further on at that point. Um, he, he then then there's a gap because we don't know. But uh, in September 1969, uh, his he, the fire at the mill where at his house and it was so devastating. He lost the two, last two scenes of um, of Taverner. He must have not. Been, he must have just written them. So, I mean, there's quite a gap there, which we don't really know what happened. Uh, he had to rewrite them again. And so you can see that by the, the according to the pencil full score, they, the, the, they were actually completed then on the 24th of November, 1970. I, I must mention Daphne Outwin's um, master's thesis from Kingston Polytechnic in 1983. She goes into quite a lot of the detail of the relationship between Tavener and the two Tavener Fantasias. And really quite usefully, she gives a kind of uh, an example of how the, the second Tavener and Tavener share common material. Uh, but then the, the last one, going back to, to Resurrection, he, I like this one again because I'm arranging to see brain surgery and heart ops. Again, he's back to this tavern and we've seen a bedtime morality play. No, it's going to be ready in two years, by the way, 1965. Well, that was 20, 22 years out. So that's the end of the timeline. Um, I hope that's useful when people can come and have a look at what's what's there. Richard, thank you. Thank you so much. I mean, that, that is incredibly detailed and incredibly helpful to, to have this outline um, uh, of, of the protracted genesis and development of the, of the libretto and, of course, the music. And um, yes, that, that will be obviously available on, on, on the video there. And uh, thank you so much for doing that. I think it really sets up the, the context really well um, for, for Simon. Um, so thank you. Thank you so much. I'm going to pass over to Simon now. And uh, so you're, Simon is, is joining us from Adelaide and it's uh, the evening time for him there. It's morning for us. So uh, thank you, Simon, for, uh, for you know, um, sacrificing your, your Friday evening for us. It's a pleasure, Nick. Hello, everybody. Um, thank you for that, that Richard. It's uh, that was just um, it's fascinating to see the the gestation of the piece. And I, you know, I I I, I forget that it, you know, he was he was writing this thing for twelve years, and he he began it in 1956. And we, you know, we know that from 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 what you say there, and and uh, it's ex extraordinary to see all those 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 letters and the stuff about Benvenuto Cellini I hadn't I haven't clocked that at all but look I thought I'd just begin by um just talking initially a little bit about how how I knew I knew Max and how I worked with Max and one of the first things I I did in preparation well I didn't wasn't in preparation I just pulled it off my bookshelf the other day and there's this can you see that it's um a celebration of um the St Magnus Festival it's a book 
which is um, a rather lovely book. And it's got lots of fantastic pictures and it's got all the programs, lots of the programs in the, in, uh, from the festival from 1977 up until about 2000, I think. So I was, I was looking at it because um, I obviously I got it. I, I, I got it when I was up at one of the festivals, um, probably in around, I think probably about 2000, maybe. 2001 um but the first time i i i sort of worked closely with max i suppose or got to know him a little bit was probably in 1998 so i was up there as a producer for the for the bbc um in in orkney um and the bbc scottish symphony orchestra um had i think there were two concerts that year um with martin brabin's conducting um the first one was, um, I think it was the Jacobite Rising in a, in, a, in a venue called the Phoenix Cinema. I don't know if people remember the Phoenix Cinema in, in Kirkwall. Um, and that Martin was um, conducting that concert. And then the second concert was in, was in, the, um, in the cathedral, in St. Magnus Cathedral. And it included um, a performance of the second Taverna Fantasia. And um, it sort of knocked me out. If I'm completely honest, it was just extraordinary. I, thought, I, I hadn't really heard the music before. Um, it was incredibly, dis quite very difficult for the orchestra and putting it together in the cathedral was no, you know, mo no mean feat. Um, and um, anyway, I sort of, I, I, I was, I, I guess I fell in, in, in love with the piece and um, we went back in 2001 or two. So for the, and again, I think, Max conducted um, a performance of Symphony Number no. Eight, so um, the um, Antarctic Symphony. And um, there's another book. Can you see that? So it's. Uh, have you seen that before, Nick? That that this book. Yes, yes, I've got a copy of that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So it's again, it's a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful thing to have. And um, so Max conducted the orchestra in in that performance of the Antarctic Symphony in. Um, in the Picacoy Centre, I think, and again, I was around quite a lot for that, and um, and that was a uh, yeah, it was it was fantastic to have him work with the orchestra. Um, my my memory of him as a as a as a as a conductor, as people probably know, is is that it, sometimes it was a little bit challenging for our our musicians, um, but nevertheless, he 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 seemed to get. Get what he he wanted out of the out of the out of the players and and our our players loved working with him. Um, so when um, two thousand and nine came along, um, which was as we know was his seventy fifth birthday year, um, it was a it was a no brainer that the BBC would certainly do do something. Um, and so we tried to get our sort of collective ideas together in in, in Glasgow. Um, with the Scottish Chamber Orchestra and also with the um, RSNO as, as well um, and coordinate programming. Um, and one of the ideas that came up for, um, for the BBC Scottish was that we do a, a, a concert performance of Taverner. Um, knowing that, um, of course, the BBC Symphony Orchestra had done a recording with Ollie Nusson, um, I think from the late 1990s, which was, was on an, although the record probably wasn't released then, I think it was an NMC disc. So. Um, so we 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 went about um, putting together a concert performance. Uh, Martin um, Brabins conducted it. Um, we we cast it together, um, and um, that happened. And um, I think it was I think it was rebroadcast um, in two thousand and sixteen, if I'm not mistaken. That that broadcast um, recording um, first done, as I say, in November two thousand and nine. Um, and I think that was pretty much the last time I actually saw Max. Um, although I think in October of that year, he, he, we, we were again doing some of his music. We did a, we, I think the, the BBC commissioned, and correct me if I'm wrong, Richard and Nick, commissioned um, an overture to, to um, St. Francis of Assisi, um, which we did then. I think in, again October two thousand and nine. I think Elan Volkov conducted that, and that was in in Glasgow. Anyway, I think it was in November. It probably was the last time I saw Max after after Taverner, and we were in the. Uh, it's quite vivid in my memory. We were in the in the green room at City Halls in 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 Glasgow in Candlericks, after the after the after the um the concert after the recording. And Max was there and lots of players were there and there were some speeches and it was was lovely. And um, 
at the end of the evening, I went and said goodbye to him because um, I, uh, I said, um, it's, it's, it's quite likely that I'm going to be moving to Australia, Max. And, um, you know, and so in, he said, where? And I said, well, we're going to, um, the family and I, we're, going, we're going, probably going to Adelaide. And of course, I had no idea. And he said, oh, well, give Adelaide my love. So um, I said, oh, right, okay, why? And then he, and he told me that he, he was, he'd been at the Elder Conservatorium of Music here um, in 1966 for about six months as as as, um, as a composer in residence. So um, so I thought, oh, that would be that's super. And you know, when I get get to Adelaide, we'll try and program some of his music, which indeed we 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 did for in his um, for his 80th birthday year. Um, again, Martin was working with us here in in Australia, and uh, we we did um, that that overture again. Um, and uh, we were hoping um, around, you know, before he died, we would actually get Max out here again, um, which much to my sorrow, we, we did not. Um, um, but I think that the university conferred a DMUS um, for Max. Um, Nick, I think I've got that right. Um, I think it was posthumous, I'm not sure. Um, but mm. uh, so, so that, that happened. Um, and then when Max died in 2016, I'd sort of always harbored after writing something, um, doing a PhD and um, I thought of Taverna and um, because of the, this, this sort of rather, rather lovely connection with, with, with Adelaide and with, with Max and, um, and the fact, as, as Richard mentioned uh, earlier, um, before we, we went, came online, that you know he was actually probably writing some of Taverner and World's Bliss um, when he was here in Adelaide. So, so um, hence I, I I did my PhD, which I finished um, a couple of years ago, and um, and here we are. Um, so. I guess I just wanted to talk a little bit about give you the headlines from my from my my thesis, um, but um, I guess I wanted to begin by saying that I I feel that I've really only ever only really scratched the surface of the piece um, in what I've written. I've, I suppose I wrote about seventy eighty thousand words, um, but I do feel that I only scratched the surface. So there's a so there's so much more work to be done on what I've, I I believe is to be an incredibly rich 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 piece um so i just thought i'd begin by just um quoting um ivan hewitt actually who wrote who in his um obituary for, for for max um he wrote the following he said um this was in the guardian in 2016 march 2016 davis himself thought that the 1950s were his best period period but the general consensus is that beyond the often performed expressionist scores his really great work is taverner which hasn't been seen since its inaugural production. Um, so this sort of set, set, set me, me thinking as well in 2016 that, you know, in some ways I think the piece really needs advocacy because, uh, you know, some, some I think, think some, some people regard it as, as Ivan clearly does a, a great work, even a, a masterpiece. And yeah, actually Max referred to it as, um, and whether this is a bit tongue in cheek, I don't know, but he re referred often to it as the work of an apprentice. Um, so there's this sort of, you know, duality to the piece. Um, and I just, I just, I still believe that today it's, it's, it's a, a work that's incredibly relevant and, and needs a, it needs a, you know, a contemporary production 50 years on, on as, as Nick says, next Tuesday. We haven't seen it on the stage for 37 years, so it, it badly needs an outing in, in, in my view. Um, so I, I think my, 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 my PhD was certainly advocating for that. Um, when we did it in, in Scotland, I, yeah, I have some, some strong memories of, of Max being there because he was there for, for pretty much all the rehearsal period in, in the city halls. Um, and um, I remember him, 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 him saying, I think it was to Tom, Tom Service that, you know, when Tom said, you know, what's it like listening to this music after, after so long? Max said, he said, it's a bit like looking at yourself in a mirror, um, you know. Uh, and I remember him sitting in certainly some of the rehearsals um, 
and he was humming some of the in nominees, some of the plane in you know, the plane song. So he 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 remembered it. You know, it was very very um, very very I guess very very within him. Um, and I also remember him sort of having quite a lot of not, not a huge amount of input into into what what was going on on the platform. But there was one moment certainly, um, which is in Act One, Scene Four. Um, which is when um, the the Antichrist um, um, screeches um, into um, in, uh, um, uh, over the orchestra um, um, this pa this papal um, papal edict I think um, and in Latin um, and um, it's a it's a horrific a horrific moment a terrifying moment um, you know. Uh, and Max was very specific about where he wanted um, the, the 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 singer to go, um, and he we placed him up in a balcony in the city halls. Um, so he was, as I say, singing right over the orchestra, and um, and Max um, insisted that he had a megaphone as well. And uh, and 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 I, I remember him saying to me and Martin, um, "You know who it is. You know who it is. It's it's it's, it's Goebbels." It's Goebbels, he said. You know, it's um, and it was a, it was, it was a very, very powerful moment actually. Um, so that's that's my memory memory of him with 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 Taverner in 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 in, in Scotland. Um, so anyway, so I ended up here, and um, so I thought now, I, I, Nick, Richard, if you've got any any anything you want to just jump in with them, please please do say. Um, but I thought I would just sort of go through some of the headlines of, 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 of my thesis. Yeah, well, before you do that, I've, I've just got a quick question, Simon. You mentioned there the Max being a little bit hands-on in terms of the Antichrist and, and um, where, where he was positioned and the megaphone. I mean, in other areas, how hands-on was Max? Did he sort of, how much input did he have into, on, into the recording process? I think he was he was interested again, if memory serves me right, and it's a while ago now. But he 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 certainly came down to the to the what we would call the cubicle, the control room, and you know he'd, he'd listen to the listen to the balance. I think in the in the in the room um, in the in the hall, um, he certainly had you know again we'd we'd have to talk to Martin about the detail of it. But I do remember him having some comments about the. The, the bands, the um, the, because there are these on-stage bands in the in the opera, and in the um, original productions they were um, they were they were period instruments, so they were viols and there were shawms and there were there were um, serpents, um, and but we did it in a, in a in a in a modern way in Scotland. Um, we didn't have access to or, or budget to do that. Um, so Max, he was very he was very keen on making sure that that worked in terms of you know the the temperament and certainly the you know the, the the sound of the thing in in the room and how that that worked he was also because we did it it was it was it was a it was a it was a concert performance although we did do some some lighting and there was some sort of stagecraft going going on and when the soldiers process in in in, in act two um with the with um with uh, playing drums he was, he was he was sort of quite interested in how that worked in terms of timing um and and in terms of lighting he was uh, he was uh you know i i again my if my memory is is correct he sort of had things to say about the the color of the washes that we were using i think i again we had this sort of golden what color wash for the for the for the throne room and then when we went into the into the into the um into the uh into the um outside the, the color changed or when we were in the in the chapel we had this sort of a, a lighter blue and i think he had a, again i i remember him having some some thoughts about that in a positive way i from what i recall <laughs> and and th thanks thanks for that the you, you mentioned max going into the um i forgot what phrase you used the the, the booth the cubicle no the cubicle, right? yeah. yeah 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 um how interested was he with all of the kind of the technical side of of the recording I'm, I'm just fascinating to know that i don't i don't think he was overly interested in you know where where microphones were were were, were placed um i think he uh it like like a lot of 
composers that I I work with um, back then, including people like Jonathan Harvey, um, I I was always struck by the way that they 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 listen differently to 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 the way that I listened actually. Jo Jonathan Harvey, sorry, we're coming it's a little bit off off topic here, but Jonathan Jonathan listened to sort to sonorities. You know, he listened to music in a very, very different way. He listened to the, you know, he'd hear things that I just wouldn't begin to hear, but it wasn't to do with rather prosaic things like ensemble and intonation. He 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 was he was he occupied a sort of a higher sphere, Nick. You know, it was a it was a different sort of world and a different way of listening. And I I, I again, my memory of, of of Max is that he he listened like that as well. You know, the, 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 he was. It was it was it was a sort of uber listening, um, so it was beyond me. But I look in terms of the sort of the technical, the, the technical interest that he had in the in the way um, things happened. I, I I don't think there was a great passion for that. I could be yeah. wrong. Yeah. Thank you. Shall I crack on a little bit? Yes, and that would be great. Time? Thank you. Just just tell just just again, please, Richard, just jump in. Sally, just jump in if you've got anything you want to say. So I was just going to begin by, and again, Richard sort of set this up beautifully. Um, but I suppose by the, the the first part of my thesis is about trying to put Taverner in in context and and um, where it sits creatively. And I think one of the things that that sprang out of me that it's you know it's it's there is this sort of Taverner constellation of works, including the Seven in Nominees, the First Fantasia, the Second Fantasia. Revelation and Fall, Antichrist, and there is this 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 constellation at which you know the South, you could argue that Taverner sits at the the middle of it. Also, World's Bliss, eight songs, obviously 1969, and then then um, whether we we've, we've referred to it as a as a sequel to Taverner or not, I don't know. But, but Resurrection um, between 1963 and 1987. Um, so that was one of the, the the things that really struck me, and. Um, I, I think the other thing that struck me was that, and again, this sort of speaks to to Richard's timeline, is that it's um it's quite it was quite I find it quite difficult to actually um to 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 get a grip on when he was writing which bits of of the opera because it seemed that he was writing other things at the same time. There was always another project going on. I don't know if that's that's true, um, but. Um, and then, of course, the, the 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 other thing that I was all was struck by was that it's that the opera um, I don't I don't think was written to, to commission Nick Richard was it? It was something that he just he just did. Is that right? Yes, it was wasn't written to commission. Uh, I mean, he did actually uh, was looking for a commission for the resurrection one from Sadler's Wells, but no. Um, at the point at which he was writing it, he was writing it because he felt he had to, not not because yeah. he commissioned. And this and this and again, I think Richard's timeline set, sets this up as well. That that you know, it, that it was the text that I think seemed to come first. The text came, you know, the text he talks about the text and the imagery coming to him, him first. And um, I'll talk a little bit about the libretto because the the libretto is you know is arguably you know, one of the things that I think probably got um, criticised most at, um, at the, at the, the first performances. Um, and then the actual, the, the, the production at Covent, Covent Garden um, in 1972, um, again, it's, it's I, 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 I was struck by the fact that I think it was quite a difficult birth. And when I was, I went and spent a little time, a bit of time in the Royal Opera House um, archives looking at um, some of the the opera house um, the board papers um, and certainly it seemed to come into focus um, quite late in the day um, John Tooley was was um, the, the the managing director at that time and I think that they, they there was a hope that um, that Ken Ken Russell would actually um, produce the opera um, of course Max had worked with with him on um, the devils, I think, um, and quite late in the day, from what I remember, um, Ken Russell withdrew, um, and then there was this sort of quite uh, from from again from reading these the, the war papers at the Opera House. There was there was quite an intense, but quite it seems to be quite 
slightly chaotic search for somebody else to produce it. And they were they were looking at other people, including um, Sam Wanamaker. They were looking at Stanley Kubrick at one point. And eventually they, they landed on um, Michael um, Jellier to produce it. Um, and again, it sort of all seemed to happen quite, quite, quite quickly. Um, I think, I, I, again, I can't remember the exact timeline, but um, I think, you know, it was, they were still talking about the production, who was actually going to produce it as late as, um, as, 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 you know, November, December, 1971, maybe, or, you know, even maybe beginning of 72. Um, and then there was the, the, the whole, um, who was going to, going to conduct because as we know Schulte was 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 the um, music director at the opera house then and didn't have a huge amount of interest in um in 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 new british work um colin davis um took over from Schulte and i think he vested um ted downs um to do to to to, to conduct um the opera um which uh which he did um magnificently from 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 what I can understand um there's another a rather nice little um connection here in as much as that uh um when I got to the um, Adelaide Symphony Orchestra um uh, I realized there was a relationship with um Jeffrey Tate the conductor Jeffrey Tate and Jeffrey um actually um uh, did the um, first uh, complete performance of the ring here in Adelaide um back in the 1990s I think um and uh, Jeffrey then came back, um, uh, probably this is about six years ago, as our principal guest conductor, um, and was with us, um, for, worked with us again for a couple of years, and um, until he he died died a couple of years ago. Um, but when he was here, um, we had a, he and I. I was writing um, my PhD, and um, I told him what I was writing about, and he uh, he. Um, he said, oh, Taverner, yes, I was the repetiteur on Taverner, which I sort of made me fell off my, my chair. And um, of course he had, he had, he had some, some memories of the rehearsal period being really quite difficult um, because it was so, so hard, frankly. And, um, uh, but, um, and one of my plans with my thesis was actually to try and get hold of Jeffrey's um, score of um when he was when he you know when he was repetitor um but he uh as i say he when well, he died and that didn't come to fruition but that score still exists somewhere as does ted downs apparently um so whether there was a bit of a compromise birth for for, for the opera in 1972 is 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 moot but having said that you know um rodney mills and Paul Driver, particularly, I've, I've made note. Paul Driver referred it to it as one of the, the great, great operas of of, of the world. Um, so one of, I think, one of the things that I did with, with my with my PhD um, was was I tried to sort of um, I tried to make it a a sort of more interdisciplinary approach and um, in, in in how I approached the opera. I sort of decided quite early on um, not to be heavily analytical um because a lot of work has, has been done in in that regard by by well by david roberts particularly um so my my approach was to look at 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 at, at, at sort of influence the influence study um using kevin corson's um terminology and um so i i i, I began by looking at parallels and influences um in uh, uh, it, across the opera and um and i'll just just give you the headlines of some of those sort of discoveries and again please just do 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 way way in i think one of the the things that, that struck me very quickly was um um was neo-expressionism and 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 the way this 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 I, I read this word being used quite 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 a lot and of course it made me think of well, makes one think of expressionism and and max's um you know, uh, I don't know if obsession is quite quite the, the right word, but his fascination and, and love of Piero Lunaire of, of, of Schoenberg, um, and in, in, indeed in, in, in that regard, it, it made me think of, of you know of, of, of Kandinsky and and then Max's relationships with um, with um, with uh, 
with with um, visual arts, and and he refers to um, his love of of, of, or of Francis Bacon, for example, um, and it makes 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 me think of, of the Francis Bacon free you know, scream, screaming popes and invisible rooms of of, of caged people and eight songs of the mad for a mad king, um, etc. And and that in turn led me to to explore um, the world of um, of some um, of some neo expressionist German um, artists, including people um, like George Basilitz and Anselm Kiefer. Um, Basilitz, again, I don't know if these names uh, mean anything to, to, to people, but Basilitz was, uh, was fascinated with the, um, the art of inversion, um, which again speaks to, to Tavernet in many ways. Um, uh, the, the act two could be read as an inversion of act one and, and you know, the 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 the, the, um, the cardinal cardinal in in, in Act One becomes um, becomes um, the Archbishop in in Act Two, so um, Reformation England becoming post Reformation England, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, the another neo expressionist artist um, is, 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 is Anselm Kiefer, and again, um, there's a lot of autobiography biography in 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 his work. Um, Particularly, a, a series of of, of, of paint of um, photographs um, where he he, he he portrays himself dressed up um, in 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 the garb of Hitler Youth, um, facing out to sea and doing the the, the the Hitler salute. And again, this sort of um, themes of identity and and um, of um, identity and autobiography very important. Um, the other things which I, I landed on, and this was thank you to, to Richard for this, was um, was 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 uh, was um, off the back of um, some of what Richard has, has noted about um, um, Artaud and the Royal Shakespeare Company's Theatre of Cruelty in the nineteen sixties, led me to think about Max's Max's um, not dramaturgy, but the way the way. Um, he 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 presents some of his some of the characters um, in a sort of a sort of a, a Brechtian way, um, um, and again there's a there was a there was a link here to to Michael Gelliot, who was the producer of um, Tavern in 1972. He he actually I think he produced some of the some productions of um of, of the first productions of Brecht in in London in the in the 1960s. But Brecht very much this world of epic theatre um, and Brecht focusing on historicization defamiliarization of characters, um, estrangement and gallows humour. Um, again, speaks sp spoke to me um, about Taverner because in Taverner the characters um, are, Max I think referred to them as, 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 as cardboard cutouts. Um, and again, this sort of defamiliarization um, in terms of the fact that we know that the king is, well, King Henry VIII. Um, we know that, um, um, the cardinal is Cardinal Wolsey, but he, they're never named as such in the opera. They're these cardboard cutouts, and which made me think about Brecht and and the fact that Max also referred to the the characters in in, in Taverner as, as as being marionettes, as as being puppets um, controlled by um, as he said the master, the master, and the master puppeteer who is 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 the jester, the the jester death. So. Those were some of the, the influence and parallels that I sort of came across. Um, and then the whole issue, whether it is grand opera, I guess, was a, was a, was a, was a question. I mean, Max referred to it. He said, it really is an opera with a capital O and perhaps the only one I'll ever write. I think he said that in 1983. Um, so whether it is grand opera, music theatre, whether it's um, parodying grand opera, I don't know. But the themes that it sort of embraces are certainly those of, of, of grand opera. Um, betrayal, this, the, the constant um, discussions between you know, the, 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 yeah, the, the, the tension between church and state. So the, church, the, the, the tensions between religion, Catholicism and Protestantism. Um, all these things, um, truth um, is a huge, huge, obviously a huge, um, a huge question which he grapples with, with within the opera and with in many other, uh, in, other in any many other pieces. Um, at the time as well, I think I landed on, I discovered sort of resonances, if you like, um, 
of, 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 of other other things that were, were were inspired by that world of the time and um two spring to mind and one was was is a film by Hal Wallace called um, Anne of Anne of the Thousand Days um which again is is very much the world of, of Henry VIII and the other is of course A Man for All Seasons by Robert Bolt which is um explores um Thomas More's relationship with with Henry VIII um so there were felt there were there were lots of things going on in the 1960s, which really you know which and Max was was on the money, if you like, with the with 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 with, with the subject, um, and then another area, another theme which I sort of explore a bit was was this whole world of the psychological, because Max talks about um, the opera as being a whole thing, as being a projection of Taverner's mind. Characters in the opera are incarnations of departments of his own mind or soul or psyche. Um, and again, it made me think, and I, again, I explored this um, in, in, a, in some depth, the world of Evartung, of Schoenberg, of, of Wozzeck, um, but really interestingly of, of Peter Grimes, um, which is a, we know is a, is a, is a piece of work that, that Max, um, um, I think was 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 quite in awe of. Um, Grimes is again, uh, without going into a huge amount of detail, there, there seem to be quite a lot of parallels. I mean, the beginning of Grimes is 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 in is in, in, the, in, the, in a courtroom where Grimes is 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 on trial for, and at the beginning of Taverner is in a courtroom. Um, in Grimes, is the 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 mob who pursues Grimes and. In Taverna, there is the 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 village, the 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 the, the um the village the, uh, the 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 in in Boston in Lincolnshire, the the villagers all come at, to, together as a sort of as a mob. So there are the, all these 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 resonances that I sort of sort of discovered or or, or try to draw parallels with. Um, and then just continuing the idea of the psychological. Um, Again, I think Richard maybe referred to it in his timeline. This is the, 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 the influence of, of Jung and indeed of, of Freud and this character in the opera, Death, the Jester, who is, as you could argue, is the real, is the, is the, is, is the, is the power behind the throne. He's Taverner's inner demon. He, again, he, he's uh, he's uh, he is the character that pulls the strings. He's sort of Taverner's alter ego. Um, and again, this 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 made me think a little bit about um about uh, the time in you know which in which Taverner wrote wrote um, Max wrote Taverner and the time that Schoenberg wrote wrote Piero and Avatung. It was the time of Jung and Freud, of course, and, and when Max was writing Taverner, it was the time of R.D. Lang's The Divided Self and and um, an uh, American psychologist called I think Thomas Zass. I don't know if if you know that name. Who was who 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 wrote quite extensively about, you know, uh, interrogated what, what we believe madness to be, um, which again speaks to, to Max and madness, which I know is a huge, a huge subject, whether eight songs from Mad King, we know that Max wrote, I think, mad, 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 mad in inverted commas in one of the score, what is madness, what, did, what does it mean? Um, and Thomas Saz, who, 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 as I say, was was writing at that time, quite a controversial figure, I think. He 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 once he, he wrote, "If you talk to God, you are praying. If God talks to you, you have schizophrenia. If the dead talk to you, you are a spiritualist. If you talk to the dead, you are a schizophrenic." Is Taverner mad? I don't know. Was uh, you know King George mad? Um, and again, there are there resonances there with, with Peter Grimes, perhaps. Um, and then another um, another avenue which I explored a little bit was this whole world of Künstler Oper or artist opera. Um, um, there's a writer called uh, Claire Taylor Jay has written a, a, a great a great book on on this, where she looks at the works of of um, she has three sort of case studies, I guess. Um, Kranich's um, Johnny Strikes Up. Um, Matis de Mahler of Hindemith and also um, Fitzner's Palestrina. And I explore this whole di idea of, of autobiograph auto the autobiographical nature of, 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 of Taverner and Max um, and this, this, this personal crisis um, that uh, 
that arguably, um, you know, um, Max recognized that in Tavener in, in himself, perhaps. Um, so look, I could go on a little bit more about the structure of the piece. I could talk about the libretto a bit. The libretto is a very, a very, um, a very interesting one because, as we know, um, he wrote his, his it, it, it's, it's Max's own libretto. Um, I think he wrote libretti for three of his other operas: Resurrection, Martin of St Magnus, and, and, and the Lighthouse. Um, it's, um, and I think it's important just to just to. To just talk about this very briefly, and as much as I said, the text seemed to come first. There's that reference that Richard found um, to, the, to, 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 to the text and the, the imagery and the, the, the music coming and burning his fingers. It was it was it, it's fascinating how the, the text sort of drew, drove so so much much of of the work, and the text is in some ways you know arguably critically it was as I said it was the thing that that that. That got some negative criticism. Um, it was referred to as as indigestible, knotty, and obscure, lacking lacking clarity because it's incredibly eclectic. It's incredibly incredibly eclectic. The text is is assembled. And I think he assembled it when he was in in Princeton in the Firestone Library. So he had he still had access to 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 lots of lots of, his, of these sources, whether they were um, uh, court papers. Um, the sort of biblical um, biblical passages. Um, the, the parts of the text are in ecclesi ecclesiastical Latin. Part of the text refers to to to, to Jung. Um, so it's a it's a it's a it's a very 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 dense text. Um, and how it works in terms of its relationship with the music is, I think, when we put the opera on in in Scotland was one of the great challenges, certainly for the for the for the for the cast. Um, because the text is is, is 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 tricky and allied to the way that Max sets the text of the lines. The lines are often very you know very very angular. Um, interestingly, I I found a, a, a lovely quotation somewhere that 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 Max went and talked to Michael Tippett about opera texts and. And Tippett said that an opera plot should be you should be able to write it on the on the back of a postcard. Um, not sure you could do that for Taverner. Um, and then the whole, the whole, um, the whole world of just staying with text very briefly. Um, the whole world of vocal expression in Taverner was something that I, I explored quite a bit. And and as I said, the, the, the text being so important is is you know it, it, it's key. But one of the things that struck me was that it's it's often it's it's very syllabic. And I guess this goes back to to. To Piero, where as much of Piero is syllabic and speaks to the world of Sprechstimmer and Sprechgesang, um, which again relates to the the, the idea about um, I can't remember who said it, but so in, so somebody said that Sprechstimmer may be interpreted to convey the the, 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 the the delirium of madness, which again is is you know related to Piero and the moon and lunacy and and indeed in in Taverna there is so much. Um, syllabicism and the way it is set and and, and not so much melisma. Um, why that is open for debate. Um, but you know you could argue that melisma is is more express is, is 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 expressive and the syllabic is more of more of you know of of statement and 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 more delivering um, delivering um, just de de it's declarative. Um, and maybe that's what Max was after in Tavana. I, I don't know. It, it reminds reminds me of of, of Oedipus Rex of, of Stravinsky, that sort of declarative delivery. Um, so I think that's probably coming to the end of what I have prepared, Nick. But I was just going to just just in 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 conclusion, just read you the sort of the the closing minutes of 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 my thesis because it seems that. Again, just coming back to advocating for the piece and trying to get it onto the platform, whether it's a, I don't know whether it's we regard it as, as one of his masterworks or whether it's a work of, of an apprentice, um, is, is uh, who knows. But I think, you know, if, if, if it's a masterpiece, uh, but I certainly couldn't make a call on that because I think I, I need, we need to see it on the stage. We need to see it on the stage today to make that sort of call. But it does strike me that, that, that today, just in closing, I mean, I, I, it, it is so, it, it just resonates with me particularly um, 
so just if you just bear with me for 30 seconds, um, because I, I, I wrote at the end of my thesis, I quote Michael Tippett, the child of our time, the world turns on its dark side, sings the, sings the chorus at the start of, of that, um, that um, oratorio. Um, and it was into this turbulent, uncertain world that Taverner was born, an opera written in the long shadows of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Uh, Bay Northcott, Northcott understood that also some political pressures may appear to have receded. They have now been replaced by the rise of religious fundamentalism. And because of that, the opera today is even more immediate. Today, once again, the world turns on its dark side. Russia, led by a fanatical demagogue in the mold of Henry VIII, has invaded the Ukraine. In Afghanistan, fundamentalist, fundamentalist Taliban's implement, implementation of Sharia law smacks of religious intolerance during the Reformation. In the West, the USA is ravaged by nationalist xenophobia and fake news, whilst a, I should insert this word now, a former British Prime Minister, nearly former British Prime Minister, thumbs up from Sally, plays the role of the court gesture, uh, court jester at the court of public opinion. Because of this opera is an opera, because of this tav tavern is an opera for our time. Davis once, um, Max once referred to Isaiah Berlin's thinking as key in our appropriation of truth and the importance of our accomplishing a coming of age in terms of the history of human belief and awareness. So to avoid in the 21st century, the genocide, war, political and racial dogma, which dominated the 20th century. Max said, it is against those, those terrible uncertainties that I compose music. It is an attempt to keep alive and even to achieve some kind of sanity while still remaining aware. I make no claim for lasting qualities or wider significance. It is one person's, one person's effort to come to terms with no compromise, no surrender, and in the first instance to make the very continuation of my own life possible. Of course, I'm always more than pleased when anyone else listens sympathetically. That's Max. Half a century, next week, after the first performance of Taverner, Max's message of no comp compromise, no surrender, is stronger than ever. In an increasingly polarised and anxious world, Taverner demands today that we listen not with sympathy, but with empathy. Thanks. Thank you very much, Simon. Yes, I've, I've read your, your uh, PhD and um, very, very interesting it is too. So I would highly recommend it to, to other people on the, on the network. Um, it is available, isn't it, Simon? Um, I mean, I, it, it is freely available now, I think. Yeah, yeah, it's on the, it's on the Adelaide University Digital Library. Yeah, yeah you'll find it. Yeah. That's great, thank you. Um, Sally's got a question. It's not a question, it's much more of a, a comment, I think, because the, the, the similarities between Max and, and Michael Tippett with their first operas is, is, is remarkable because Michael wrote The Midsummer Marriage over many years during the war um, and after the war to no commission. And it was a model to put on. And I mean, Covent Garden put it on in this extraordinary way as they decided to accept the challenge of Taverner. I mean, what was in their heads, what they thought they were doing? I've no idea, I'm glad they did it, but you know, and again, the same kind of model over, because Michael wanted Peter Brook to direct it. And of course, Covent Garden didn't have the nous to realize that that's who they should have had. But um, I was interested, really interested in the, in the relationship with the text and the music, because again, the, the text of the Miss of a Marriage is, is, is in many ways for people a, a big block. And um, Michael always said that the text is just there as, this, you know, it's, it's just there to serve for music. It's not there as a text to be read, but it is difficult to put across, I think, for singers, even now. For, 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 um, but I think that singers and musicians would have a much easier time with it now. I mean, your lot, they found it difficult, but not impossible like they must have done when Ted Downs, that hero, that amazing man, did it. Um, and I think it would be easier to put across now, but I'm, that, that relationship between text and music is very interesting, I think. I also think that, that Michael, um, really, The Miserable Marriage is his grand opera, and after that, they're all, they're all more of music theatre, unfortunately, all put on 
in a cross arch context, which Graham Vick magnificently disproved with the icebreak in Birmingham. And it just was a, a completely different experience. And Max, again, didn't have, but he was not well served really theatrically. I mean, the res yeah, resurrection, I I resurrection was a nightmare, an absolute nightmare. Yeah, no, I mean, I, th I think from what I remember reading, Sally, I mean, with with that first production in 72 and Richard and Nick will correct me if I'm wrong, but, you know, it was I think he he wasn't very happy. I think he was unhappy about the certainly about the, the offstage bands and, you know, that, that that certainly, you know, didn't 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 work, I think. And I think he, I he say though, that for me in the opera house, I was completely stunned by it. I've never seen anything remotely like it before. It was incredible. Yeah. So, oh, golly, you were there. You were there. Oh, yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. Because that's the other thing. I mean, I the number of, yeah, the number of people that were, were also there, Sally, J Judith Weir, she was um, working with us a couple of years back. And again, I was talking to her about Taverner and she said, oh, yes, I was there as well. Richard Mills, who is a composer here, he was, he was, he was, he was there. He played in Fires of London. He's a percussionist, actually. So I think it was yes. a huge, huge, huge event, must not it? In, it in, was, in the, it was a huge event. And I think that this thing about latching onto the text is a mistake. It's a mistake yeah. to think that it's a thing of itself. It's not. Absolutely no. not. No, no. And I think that's right. And again, there's a reference. I can't remember who it is, but somebody referred to the text as being polyphonic. You know, so yeah. it's, you, you, just, you can't you can't you can't read the text as an as, as a no, it, yeah, absolutely. It, thing. It, it speaks to everything. And I think, you know, that's certainly one of the things that I, you know, you it's an obvious thing to say, but you can't you can't read it by itself. It's 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 part of the it's a whole thing. <laughs> yeah. Um has anyone got any other questions for, for Simon? No. Okay. Well, it has gone past uh, 12 o'clock, so uh, I suppose we ought to wrap up and have our lunch and, and Simon can have his have his supper <laughs> or, or, a, or a sneaky little drink um, to, to finish off the uh, just to start the weekend for, for him. Um, just like to, to, to thank you again, Simon, for taking the time for, for speaking to us. I know you're a very it's a very busy time of year for you. And uh, so we thank you very much. And we, we thank you for your fascinating insights in, into Taverner and, and working with Max as well. So thank you. Um, so Richard, Richard, a... Richard's background, which I mean, that thing about Benvenuto Cellini, also a, a tippet obsession, Berlioz. And but the thought of the Carl Rosa putting that piece, that massive piece on, I can't imagine what it sounded or looked like. But 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 his what he picked up on that was absolutely fascinating. And saying he shouldn't have bothered with all the you know the mountain scenery and all the you know the the, the operatic bit that was really interesting. Mm. Yeah, and and thank you to Richard for that that really rich resource actually. And um and and there's a lot of a lot of work gone into that timeline, Richard. So so thank you. You're welcome. Uh, so I suppose um, we're having a short break now over the summer and we'll be back again in the autumn. And um, I think we, we've got it scheduled for October, our next Friday forum. So until then, thank you very much. And I'll hey, see Simon. you soon. Thank you, Simon. Nice to see you. Again. Simon. <laughs> nice to see Bye. you. Bye. 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 Bye bye, everyone. Bye. bye.